Okay. Technical problem. All right. Uh, back to where we were. French Revolution. Uh, French Revolution by 1792-93 is one of its more radical fades. Okay, so you don't have this. You don't have this smooth line of stability or inevitable progression. It's just lurching from one phase to the next. It's one more violent and radical than the one before. So we start off with the story of Dr. Joseph Gitti. Interesting. Fifth position. Exa, her form, among any other things. So, and his idea, among many others he's had, is try to create a more humane form of punishment, humane oh. form of execution. Yeah. Yes. The idea was the guillotine, yes. And the guillotine, um, basically this is put your head on this little, uh, see this picture on page 588, uh, put your head down, this little uh, axe blade comes down, snap the head off. Very quickly, very cleanly, very neatly. It's not like the other old ex uh, means of beheading where you just take a uh, an axe or a sword and uh, hope they get you on the first blow. But I always had the tradition of tipping the executioner. Just a little something extra to make sure they get on the first shot instead of just having to do it a few times over and over again. Uh, like I said, you've had these uh, horrible instances in the history that had these botched beheadings. Um, the axe man who just uh, was drunk or sick or just yeah. missed out of cut on purpose or on accident. Uh, one of uh, Henry VIII's wives, uh, they uh, uh, brought in a famed executioner, but he showed up drunk and uh, basically kept hacking at her over and over again, just couldn't quite get the job done. Finally, somebody just took sides up toward it, did it themselves to put her out of her misery. And so there's got to be, I'm getting inside, so there's got to be a more humane way to do this. I thought it actually sounds less painful than an electric chair. Yeah, so it's, uh, actually, interesting enough, the electric chair was invented basically by Thomas Edison proved that, uh, his main competitor, Nikola Tesla, his form of electricity was dangerous, alternating current. Like I said, see, she used direct current, see, can, uh, well, alternating current kills people. This had a lot of states uh, uh, looking at uh, new way, new modern ways of uh, executing people, but they decided, oh, this looks cool, let's try the guy. At what age were they? I don't have any reports of kids being uh, executed, uh, but uh, the end is probably around 17 or 18, that, uh, say, uh, that there have been cases throughout history of uh, children being executed. Um, there was a case in uh, the United States in the 1940s, this uh, African-American kid was uh, accused of rape, uh, no evidence, but Poor Scott, it's a Southern Jim Crow court, said, well, as he's black, he's got to be guilty. And sent him to the electric chair at the age of 14. Mm -hmm. Oh, the youngest kid. Yeah. The kid was so little they had to put him on books and stretch him up so he fit into it. Yeah. Or these executions, uh, how was that? Like the people. Oh, were these public executions? Absolutely. Page 588. Uh, these were public executions. They had uh, they had people come uh, for picnic lunch, make a day of it. They were people were selling uh, food, little miniature gallows and uh, guillotines. <laughs> I'd say it's just it's very bizarre. Uh, pretty much. <laughs> Question: uh, Did public executions do anything to affect the uh, crime rate? No. No. Like no. I said, 
When you're hungry, you're going to do Because you have to understand, you know, death penalty is not a deterrent. No. But you know... I say, because think of who kills people. It's not normal people like you and me, people with a conscience. People who kill people, they are people who uh, either they don't have a conscience, either they don't think about responsibilities or actions, or don't care about them, or they think they're entitled to hurt others, or they think they're smarter than everyone else and they can get away with it. So the execution itself is not a deterrent. Now, if you think the guy deserves to be executed, that's another question. Like I said, does this man need to be removed from the face of the earth because what he's done? That's one thing. But the question is, pun- question is not the deterrence, it's punishment. But they didn't think it that far out, did they? they didn't. Now, they, the revolution, they're trying to make an example. They're trying to destroy all the enemies of the revolution. By the time the National Convention of the particular reign of terror, it's, at its worst, the revolution has become an end in itself. So and the guillotine... Be- exactly. They are out to wipe out their enemies. Preserve the revolution at all costs. He, men behind the reign of terror, man, and Maximilian Robespierre had as a theory of revolutionary government public saying that the enemies of the revolution we owe only death. And so these great stirring sentiments of the uh, Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, that everyone is entitled to their own opinions, not under the reign of terror. Your opinion better be how much you love the revolution. They're going out after all their enemies. The but monarchists. But the isn't enemy. that the reason why they have the revolution in the first place? Exactly. It's a complete... It's They've completely hit their critical. They're so radical that they believe that only people who support the revolution should have their opinions heard. Anyone else? No, you don't deserve to have your opinion heard. And you say, well, I think you're going too far. Send you to the guillotine. The guillotine itself came as a hated symbol of the revolution and uh, the reign of terror. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people sent to the guillotine. It's supposed to be a quick, instantaneous, painless death. But was it? <laughs> yes, you must know. The interesting question was, uh, people actually asked was, did the... Uh, Head died instantly. What's in the body? Now, here you, you get your head cut off, you got like 30 seconds to a minute. To That's what some people were saying. There were actually were witnesses at some of these executions saying they thought the heads were still alive. They thought they saw the heads. But, uh, so, the scientist who uh, got his head chopped off and he got his assistant to count how many times he kept going. Yeah, there was a. Uh, yeah, the scientist did this experiment basically see. Okay, uh, <laughs> is the head still alive after? <laughs> so the guy's being executed, and they say, okay, can we have permission to study this? Oh, all right. They're <laughs> being chopped off, and then they, uh, the guy puts the head on this little platform, yells out his name. Francois, Francois! <laughs> According to his notes, he said, the eyes did open and fixed on him just for a moment. Sure or not, who knows? That makes a really cool story. I put, I put money on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. Or she's deeply disturbed right here. Of course, we say this on the night after we all watched The Walking Dead. So. <laughs> uh, but that is the guillotine. Now, France is in a state of civil war that a war with Austria. In 1793, they declare that the king and his wife were traitors. And they both executed. Both sent them both to the guillotine. In fact, the picture here on page 588, that is the execution of uh, Louis the 16th. And this is the one that they flee it. No. Yeah, they tried to flee, but they, they came back because they were fearing just exactly this thing was going to happen. Okay. But they managed to mess up their escape. Okay, what page? 588. His wife was Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette, yeah, she was uh, executed as well. On the same day? Now, a few days later. Because France, at this point, they had declared themselves to be a republic a few months earlier. This is the first French republic. Wow. 
and they decided since the monarchy has been abolished and the late 16th reign to another traitors, they will be executed. Their children were kept in prison until they died. So they were traitors because they didn't agree with the revolution? Because they didn't agree with the revolution, because they, uh, for so many reasons, they didn't agree with the revolution, they had tried to escape, but they weren't fighting the war with its full intensity uh, against Austria, mm-hmm. and particularly because they were now symbols of a called the Ancien Regime, the old regime. Who would have to make that decision? Sounds like the power. Right? Yeah, the National Convention made that decision. The National Convention voted to execute them. How long did they The rest of their lives, a couple of years, they died. All of them died. Did they not leave them? All sorts of different stories. A lot of things we're not quite sure about. It. Some of them say they just got sick and died. Uh, some say they were starved. They really don't know. A lot of secrecy around that, and a lot of people have to pay more talking. But because in you still have a lot of monarchists in the country, a lot of people believe the monarchy should still be the way the government run. They don't recognize the republic, and as long as they were alive, they were a symbol of resistance to the monarchists. They were who they were fighting for. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. So right or wrong, good or ill, that's who they're fighting for. Their king and their queen. And so the National Convention decided we have to get rid of everything from the old regime, everything from the old days. We have to start over everything, start over our culture, everything. So we're getting rid of the monarchy. We're getting rid of the king and queen so no one can ever fight for them. Because they're dead, the entire royal family's dead. Who's going to be your king and queen now? Apparently, that's it. The Ancien Regime. And you'll see this in very radical revolutions. Uh, and these extremists coming to power and decide that everything is so corrupt, there's so much connection to the old uh, regime's old ways of doing things, that we have to wipe out, cleanse, and start over our society entirely. Uh, they'll sometimes they'll change the name of the country, they'll change all the names and months of the calendar. Uh, and they start executing people left and right. Like I said, the Khmer Rouge in the 1970s in Cambodia, this was an example, is basically they swept into power and decided society was so corrupt they needed to wipe out all old influences. So anybody who had worked for the government previously, executed. Anybody who had opposed them, uh, the Khmer Rouge, executed. Uh, basically everyone was put into these slave labor camps and forced to work for the new government. Anybody. They just spoke up, families broken up, Everybody executed. Just wearing eyeglasses was enough to be executed because it showed who had an education. Mm-hmm. Next said, in Cambodia in the 1970s, the only reason you needed glasses was so he could read, and that meant you were educated. Therefore, you had a mind, therefore, you were correct. You were a three? Yes. Yeah. And two million people were slaughtered out of a total population of about 10 million. Because you wore glasses? Because you wore glasses. Oh, I would have been good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, what do you think? I'd be, I'd be, I chair a city commission. I'm a college professor. Oh, yeah, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm, the guy, I'm the guy they target these revolutions <laughs> <Yeah>. first. <laughs> you would be the first to go. Yep. <coughs> of course, we live in a much calmer country. <laughs> But guillotine, uh, Louis XVI is one percent. Um, and when Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI are executed, that is a declaration of war on every monarchy in Europe. All the monarchs are terrified that the same thing could happen to their country and the same thing could happen to them, so they immediately declare war on France. But all stops to uh, put down the revolution once and for all. And there were no monarchs that agreed with the revolution, or were there? Was that Were there any monarchs that agreed with the revolution's idea or like that? No, they were all that so wanted to keep everything the old ways. One man, one rule. No democracy, no freedom. Like I said, the ideas of the French Revolution were just something they met with just absolute disgust. Something that must be destroyed once and for all. 
French ride around the slogan, Liberty, Equality, and Fraternity. Represented the three colors of the French flag. Echo liberty, uh, freedom and justice, equality, everyone equal for the law, fraternity, daddy and brotherhood. It's not frat house at a college, no, uh, daddy and brotherhood. It's everyone was united in France by the common French heritage, nationalism. Say so they weren't united by the fact they had a common king, they were united by a common heritage. And so in the meantime, the National Convention is trying to maintain order. They have a civil war going on in France between the monarchists and the republic. And now they're at war with everybody all over Europe. So France has got a lot of problems at this point. So they convene a committee of public safety headed by Maximilien Robespierre, a member of the National Convention. Basically, the Committee of Public Safety, their job was to maintain order wherever they could, by whatever means necessary. And so, Rubs Pierre, the Committee of Public Safety, they went to mass executions. Anybody who was fighting the government was a traitor and therefore needed to be executed. They had mass executions. Mass shootings, guillotinings going day and night. Interesting enough, the French government used the guillotine up until the 1970s. They abolished the death penalty entirely after that. Mm -hmm. Like I said, they even had some villages where they just lined people up in front of this cannon and just shot, uh, shot them all with a cannon. Like I said, and because the Ch Roman Catholic Church was heading so much resistance against the Republic, they became an enemy of the state themselves. The process of de-Christianization began to be pushed by Robespierre and others. Basically, abolishing the church uh, and replacing all the religious holidays with the uh, public festivals and uh, other events. But the idea of the revolution itself, the idea of the people taking charge and ruling, liberty, equality, and fraternity, that stirred the French people. And they signed up to, uh, for their armies by the thousands. In 1793, you have 650,000 men in the army. Right, just a few years before, an army of 30,000, 30, 35,000 considered a big army. They got 650,000 men. The next year, 1794, yeah, enlistment peaks at 1,169,000 men. That's when we start getting the armies of a million men. So they're rallying. Uh, and before long, not only are they, are they, are they uh, uh, matching what all the armies of Europe can throw at, uh, at France, they're actually rolling them back and winning. It's here on page 589, the areas of rebellion in France. But 591, by the uh, mid 1790s, these rebellions are at an end, and France is gone on the offensive and they're rapidly acquiring more ter territory. Large areas of Italy, Switzerland, uh, the Low Countries, Holland, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, and so forth. Next they have new generals, uh, people who are not involved in the army previously, coming from under Napoleon Bonaparte. We'll talk about more in a minute. But Rose Pierre, the Committee of Public uh, Safety, they're supposed to uh, repress any counter-revolutionary activity. And Robespierre takes on his job with a zeal, basically executing people left and right. And the power ends up going to his head, actually just executing people just because he doesn't like them. And one government's overthrown another, in case increasing radical. In fact, they had an ambassador to the United States uh, the previous government, the, the Legislative Assembly, and they're trying to get the United States involved in the French Revolution, trying to get them to uh, uh, supply French ships, send troops over to Europe to fight in the French Revolution against the monarchies, but uh, 
<coughs> in the middle of all this, this uh, ambassador is causing real embarrassment for the, uh, President George Washington. He gets a note saying that he's been recalled back to France. Basically, he's been fired as ambassador. And he's to stand trial for a treason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, amb- the ambassador of the United States. He decided to stay in the U.S. and keep his mouth shut for the rest of the revolution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't a treason. Just the fact he worked for the previous uh, administration. Nothing else. Just he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he didn't have to go back? He didn't have to go back. He asked for asylum in the United States and uh, got it. He uh, like I said that we're dealing with here is people being executed for no reason at all, just who they happen to be associated with. Hardly any trial at all. An interesting breakdown was historical studies done. Who actually was executed during the uh, reign of terror? You got the nobles, the clergy, middle class. Peasants. Now, of course, when the revolution started, it's all about the nobles and the clergy, but of these, who was the most likely to be executed? Peasants. Of those killed by the reign of terror committee of public safety, only 8% were members of the nobility. Only 6% were members of the clergy. You know, they're stirring up this uh, rage against the uh, republic. Middle class, 25%. Great bulk of it, peasants. The lower class, 60% are executed. Uh, not Of those executed, 60% were peasants. Three out of every five. Next, it's believed that... Uh, as many as 100,000 people were killed in France from executions and these raging civil wars up until 1794, things finally start to calming down. So wave after wave of executions, people are ter- terrified, everything being changed and shifted around. The metric system was introduced during the French Revolution. Again, because the old conventional system was part of the Ancien Regime, and they had to start over. So more modern, more scientific, more tuned with the Enlightenment, the metric system. There's basically everything measured on a base 10 system. Meters, length, liters for volumes, and grams measuring mass. Next say Members of a meter versus a centimeter. Uh, you have 100, me- 100 centimeters making up a meter. Uh, 10 millimeters and a centimeter. So on and so forth. A thousand meters and a kilometer. Next say assembly. Uh, it takes a thousand milligrams to make up one gram. It takes a thousand grams to make up a kilogram. And so forth. Again, all designed to be a very simple system of uh, measurements. So most of the world adopted the metric system. The U.S. is the last major holdout on it. A couple other countries still use the conventional system of a feet, pounds, and so forth, miles. Why did the U.S. switch over? would. There's a lot of talk about it in the 1970s, but we decided we're, just, we're kind of stuck in our ways. We like the old system. We just kind of want to be different. I'd say at this point, we stick with the, what we got. Yeah. Right. Right. Not, a, not a big push right now to go you know, metric. Canada's gone metric. Mexico's metric. We're a conventional old English system. But not only was the measurement system changed, but also the calendar system. And up here is the what's called the Jacobin calendar. Calendar that changed to during the French Revolution. They abolished the old Gregorian calendar, the old Christian calendar, in favor of this calendar. Again, still based on a base 10 system.
Okay, Jacobin, uh, that was a, a term in the French Revolution, basically meaning a, a radical revolutionary. This is the Revolutionary Counter instituted by the National Convention. Basically, kind of keep in line with the metric system. Uh, the day was recalculated to be 10 hours instead of 24, with an hour defined as 100 minutes, minutes is 100 seconds, the whole day divided into 100,000 seconds. And uh, the entire calendar was replaced with a new one. And uh, thought by the National Commission in October 1793. It had 12 uh, 30-day months, each, so each uh, month be 30 days. Actually, you don't have to worry about February being 28 or 29 days because that uh, entire month is eliminated. February. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it still existed in time, but uh, how it was defined, uh, how it was marked, was completely different. Actually, uh, the year is counted, uh, year of being from, counted from the founding of the Republic in 1792, so the New Year coincide not, year not be on January 1st, but September 22nd, when the day of the first Republic was declared. Each month divided into three weeks, uh, called decades. Basically, you have a 10 day week. Which upset a lot of people because they work, you don't have weekends yet. You're working six, six days a week. Uh, Sunday was your day off. Now that's gone. Um, Nine-day work week, which is very popular. The new names of the days would uh, be uh, basically after numbers. Primity, Duati, Treaty, Partiti. Basically first day, second day, third day, so forth. Now, of course, the problem is the Earth is not... To, to, if you're going to keep the solar calendar, though, it's not 360 days, which we'd have here. It's 365 and about a quarter days. So you have to have those five extra days plus the leap foot uh, day every four years. So uh, several festival days are added in the calendar. The remaining days of the solar year to be celebrated as holidays each in the year, sand, called the Sans Colotids, uh, and for the pamphlets. Mm. Except these were basically days, these vir days, these uh, festival days are named after various uh, virtues of the revolution. Uh, celebration of virtue, celebration of genius, uh, labor of opinion and rewards. And the late day be the jour de la revolution, the day of the revolution. Yeah. I'd say you have the cold calendar days be changed around. Uh, sample, uh, Period of September 22nd to uh, October 21st, not September October, but uh, Vendemiaire. meaning vintage. Uh, it starts getting kind of cool and rainy the next uh, month, October 22nd to uh, November 20th. Brumaire means mist. Uh, go to summer. Um, July and August, hottest months of hottest part of the year. July 19th, August 17th, that'd be the month of Thermidor. <laughs> <Peace. laughs> yeah, the April 20th through May 20th, the uh, flowers coming to bloom. Uh, it's the month of Florial, meaning flower. Mm -hmm. Things flowering. We have an example here just how the calendar would work. You have, say, a, a Gregorian calendar date uh, January 1st, 1801. The calendar be uh, 11th day of Nivos, year 9 of the Revolution, here written in Roman numerals. The first day of the uh, Republic, September 22nd, 1792. That would be uh, one Vendemier, year one. Or even further ahead, uh, 
say May 8, 2007. On that calendar, this system would be uh, 18 Florial. Uh, year 215. So a very confusing calendar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so your birthday just be cap just be uh, recalculated as the new day and months, for example. Your birthday was on September 22nd, and now be on one vent in the air. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll be vintage, baby. Yeah. <laughs> so no religious holidays, no Christmas or anything like that. New Year's Day, September 22nd. Um, it's a very unwieldy and very unpopular calendar, but it's just how radical the French Revolution is going. It's everything thrown out. The great cathedral at Notre Dame uh, completed in the Middle Ages. A beautiful building, still standing this day. Since the Catholic Church has been banned, it is now the Temple of Reason. Oh, now it's the Temple of Reason. Yeah. Notre Dame. Except it means Our Lady, Virgin Mary. Well, uh, in 1794, get to call the Thermidor phase of the Reign of Terror. They were getting tired of Robespierre and his antics, and uh, Robespierre overplays his hand once again. Now he stands up in the National Assembly one day and decides he's going to declare that certain members of the convention itself were traitors and must be executed. Basically, political opponents. But there's no other reason than the fact they're opponents. He's rising up to declare these men to be outlaws. And uh, at that point, people on the uh, National Convention start shouting at him. Shouting, screaming when they sit down and be ruled out of order. And now the convention turns on him, demanding that Robespierre, the members of the Committee of Public Safety, themselves be placed on trial for treason. Okay. They've gone too far. They're basically executing people left and right. Is that the reign of terror? Yes, the reign of terror. This is the end of the reign of terror at this point. When the National Committee shouts down, the uh, National Convention shouts down the uh, Robespierre so, Robespierre, the members of that committee of public safety, are arrested. They're placed in an office and, um, to uh, be, uh, held for be held in place for trial. Robespierre takes out a pistol and tries to kill himself, but uh, instead the gun misfires, only the bullet ends up shattering his jaw instead. And he and other members of the committee of public safety are executed. So he was going to die the way he Yeah, so he realized what happened. So Robespierre is gone. And finally, the National Convention by 1795 establishes a new government. One that's able to meet the demands of the French Revolution, needs of a country at war, but what they have to do is they're having to scale back some of these freedoms they'd established under the National Assembly and the Legislative Assembly kind of pulling back from its most radical phase. And the government they're calling is called the Directory. Now, it's the, what I have here with the Directory is, instead of a one president or one prime minister, you have a body of five. I believe that uh, with five, you, they're not going to start try starting to seize power, try to gang up on each other, that is, they're going to have to try to work together, have to try to maintain order and power, and just uh, rule the best interest of the people, plural executive. And these men are be called directors. But now at this point, in a country of millions of adults, uh, only 30,000 people have the right to vote this, only those with property. And you have two house uh, legislative assembly. You have the council of elders, the upper house. You have to be over forty to be in the house of elders. It's going to be more older, the older people in the country. And the lower house is the council of five hundred. 
Lower House, 500 members. In fact, we get the term the United States, left wing or right wing, comes from the directory of the French Revolution. Those who are more radical sat on the left hand side of the, uh, of the assembly, the more conservatives, the, the monarchists, uh, they sat on the right side. Well, things are going well on the battlefront, though, but you have these directors who are still concerned that some people are out to get them. People are trying to destroy them, trying to destroy the revolution. And so it happens in September 1797, it was called the Coup of 18 Fructidor, and he's in the Jacobin calendar. Coup of 18 Fructidor, uh, some, more, some of the more radical directors arrested uh, several right-wing politicians accusing them of trying to overthrow to the directory in favor of a monarch. Now the problem was um, they had no evidence. People knew there was no evidence behind it, but uh, what it ends up doing is it ends up discrediting the directory government. And more and more you have people accusing the directory of, uh, of corruption, of uh, inefficiency, not uh, doing the job properly. Find more and more people just getting tired of them, just want to have the directory replaced altogether. So they're calling for yet another overthrow of the government. That's where this man comes in, Napoleon Bonaparte. He's born to a poor family in Corsica in 1769, off the mainland of France. Uh, all the major children had uh, good educations, uh, and he had joined. Napoleon had uh, joined the army during the. Early days of the revolution, decided to be part of it, and his military skill and bravery uh, led him to be, rise up in the ranks very quickly. The point by 1798-99, uh, not even 30 years old, he's already one of France's most celebrated generals. Next, like winning incredible victories on the battlefield, uh, expanding French territory and influence, and a lot of people were looking to Napoleon to uh, lead France. And for some time, they're pushing him to overthrow the directory. And said, but uh, being a child of the revolution, a real believer in the revolution, he's not quite uh, ready to do that. He's a uh, flatter by all the uh, discussion, but of him leading France. But uh, right now, he's just going to he's just going to sit back and just kind of uh, watch how the situation unfolded carefully. But by 1799, two years later, this is after the coup of 18 Fructidor, he decided that, that time was the time to strike. So he goes to the Council of uh, 500 after meeting with the Council of Elders, and they basically have the army seize control of the legislative assembly. And he called the coup of 18 Brumaire. This is uh, November 8, 1799. Napoleon uh, seizes control of the government, basically arrests the Council of 500. And so that's in half of them, basically just sends them home, just tells them they're out of a job. Uh, arrests the five directors and sets himself up as head of the government, establishing a new government with uh, Napoleon as consul, an old Roman title. And of course, he has a Senate uh, that uh, basically. Uh, acts as a legislative assembly. But he's maintaining all the forms of a republic, particularly the old Roman Republic. But what he's doing is basically everybody knows he's a dictator. So you have this whole period from about 1791 to 1804, the period called the consulship, Basically, Napoleon's in charge of keeping all the illusions of the Republic intact. He's kept the Jacobin calendar in place, the metric system, all his laws, uh, and keeps talking about the importance of maintaining and fighting for the uh, gains of the Revolution. Consulship. But, uh, of course, Napoleon comes in, he claims, he's doing this to preserve the revolution. He's a child of the revolution, he is supporting it, he's a, uh, 
both a liberal and a conservative, he's doing this as a patriot, overthrowing the elected government of France. Now, whenever there's a big coup in some country, that's what every one of these guys comes in and says. It's not just some little uh, colonel who wakes up one day and decides he wants to run the country, or some general. Basically, there's some significant portion of the government, or usually the elites, the upper classes, uh, they want the government to be overthrown. They choose one popular general or one general's popular with them to go in and do it. In this case is Napoleon. And they always say to the general public, they're doing this to save the country. I said that 15 years ago in Pakistan, the uh, freely elected government of Pakistan was overthrown by a general named Pervez Musharraf. And he went on national TV to say that uh, I'm not doing this to destroy democracy, I'm doing this to begin democracy in Pakistan when through they, military dictatorship. When in reality they're just saving themselves from their own ideals. Yeah, basically just trying to blunt any kind of possible opposition to them. Keeping all, everything, keeping as much intact, keep everybody happy, but uh, going in and basically trying to change the way everything's run. Because basically there's some significant group that doesn't like who's running the government at that point. Like I say, usually most coups around the world are started by the elites because they don't like some popular government that's been elected by the people, uh, talking about issues like land reform, uh, uh, reforms to labor and things like that. I said, no, we can't have that. Overthrow the government so we can get rid of all these things we put in place. Sometimes these coups are quick and bloodless. Sometimes they're long, drawn-out civil wars. So there are a couple of civil wars going on in different parts of the world today that start out as coups, but uh, the military was not able to seize control of the government. So they've had civil wars now going on for some case 10, 20, 30 years. But Napoleon comes in saying as he's going to uh, keep the revolution intact, he's doing this to save the revolution and to protect France from all of his enemies all over Europe. Of course, by 1799, France is mowing over all of its enemies. One country after another is falling to the French, speaking through Napoleon's leadership. He is, uh, they're fighting England. They've had this long war with England since 1794, and basically it's a stalemate with England. England's not able to make any progress against uh, France. They've basically taken over Spain. Uh, Moving against Portugal, Prussia, all these countries falling one after another. And Napoleon even goes so far as to invade uh, Egypt and Africa to uh, try to expand French influence even further. In fact, how the nose on the Sphinx is missing. Yes. The, uh, and Napoleon's artillery, they're firing at the nose just, to, uh, just, to, just for practice, just act of vandalism. But Napoleon is winning victory after victory and, re, uh, and redrawing the maps of all of uh, Europe. I see that here on page 591 versus a uh, map on page 602. France annexing large areas of territory. Of course, here on page 599, you have these uh, portions of them. Uh, he had uh, portraying himself as a hero, this tireless worker for France. In reality, he's only about, about five four or something, but uh, really a military mind. But by December 1804, he decides to get rid of the pretense, declares himself, has himself declared emperor outright. So the Republic, which had lasted from 1792 until Napoleon now officially abolished in 1804. They were what they called, France calls the First Empire. Napoleon Bonaparte as a uh, dictator, as emperor. Has himself crowned emperor, has his wife crowned uh, empress. This picture here in 599, the coronation, uh, like I said, his mother was not actually there. She was just painted a picture later. Uh, 
How much different is that than the monarchs? Really, in practice, not none at all. Next, and basically, Napoleon calls the shots, <laughs> or basically the king calls the shots. The revolution is basically come full circle. And they proved it to the human intelligence. Yep. So they went from a constitutional monarchy to a republic to a more radical republic to a less radical republic to dictatorship. So I guess you just get. I guess you just got enough support to be able to claim that position. Yeah, they had enough support. Said because one thing, he had control of all the machineries of government, and more importantly, he was winning. That's why it's important to have checks and balances. Yeah. Like I said, Napoleon didn't have any checks and balances because he had his army, he was winning, the people loved him for it. Even to this day, Napoleon is a huge hero of France. People love Napoleon. Uh, so even in southern Louisiana, you have that large French population. Napoleon's a big hero down there. Mm -hmm. But he's still facing some battles uh, here and there. Uh, in 1805, you have the famed Battle of Trafalgar uh, between the French Navy and the uh, English Navy. Uh, the English Navy is outmanned and outgunned, but they have the uh, here Admiral Horatio Nelson. Uh, he maneuvers his fleet into defeating the uh, much larger and superior French force. The uh, huge defeat for France, which meant this. Since France couldn't gain naval superiority of the seas, uh, they were unable to invade England, putting into uh, threats from England once and for all. Admiral Nelson died at the Battle of Trafalgar. There's a big statue to him in the downtown London today at the Trafalgar Square. But, uh, so by 1806, Napoleon unveils a country called the Continental System. Essentially, they're going to try to blockade England, starve it to submission, block all ships from trading with England, and uh, people on the continent, they trade only with France and the French and the Allies, those in the continental system. If you see here by 602 here, what you've got here is France has, uh, uh, they're annexing a lot of territory, the Low Countries, uh, Parts of northwestern France, northwestern Italy, and western Italy. Now parts that have been the Venetian Republic here along the Adriatic coast. And uh, everything in Europe at this point either was French territory directly or a French satellite. Basically, they just went in just to put in their own government friendly toward France and had to do everything France said. Or just an ally. Basically, a force the lies is basically... Uh, don't make trouble, go into the continental system, don't fight France, and we allow you to keep your government intact. Particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, some of these neutral countries, uh, they decide they're going to go with that instead. Just let France uh, just have its way and they'll just go along with it. Like I said, basically, the protectorates. The continental system is designed to starve England submission, but uh, a lot of people running the blockades. Uh, England's able to get uh, goods and uh, products in and out. But England has its own blockade of France. And uh, it's having an effect on its economy. Which ends up leaving countries like the United States and other neutral nations in the middle. The United States wanted to stay out of this. In fact, the United States had signed an agreement in uh, 1794 saying that uh, because the alliance was made with a previous French government that is the monarchy, that government doesn't exist anymore, that the U.S. was absolved from its uh, terms of its alliance, that they didn't have to go to war with every country in Europe. And the U.S. is trying to be neutral because the United States is still fairly weak power in 1806, 1810, 1812. Except for the United States to go to war against every country in Europe would be suicide at that point. So, uh, just trying to play a very careful game of neutrality with England and France, both careful trading partners, just basically trying to, just, just trying to mind its own business. But 
British and the French keep seizing American ships trying to challenge these blockades, and uh, so it's causing a lot of tension between the United States and both of these countries, but England especially. Because at this point, England's desperate. They're trying to, uh, you know, having some success here and there against France and some of its allies, though they're having severe manpower shortages in their navy, and they're basically seizing American ships and kidnapping American sailors, forcing them into the Royal Navy. Eventually, the United States and England are going to war with each other over the conduct of the French Revolution, over the Napoleonic Wars. But by 1806, Napoleon has basically claimed mastery of the entire continent. France controls everything. Um, but the continental system, though, wasn't entirely uh, successful. It caused something of a scandal when the, uh, people started learning that uh, some of the thick wool overcoats that the French officers, some of the French officers were wearing was made from wool from Scotland under English control. The country they're trying to blockade, they're basically still buying their wool to make uniforms for the French army. That's embarrassing. But interestingly enough, what ends up happening in some of these countries France is taking over is he's reforming the law codes, uh, something called the Napoleonic Code. Or in law codes in France and a lot of these countries all over Europe. In fact, a lot of the, these countries still have a, a lot of Napoleonic laws still on their books. Basically modernizing it from laws from the Middle Ages to the uh, early 19th century. So the Napoleonic Code uh, exit is very reform minded. It changed a lot of things, changed a lot of things about property law, about all about crime and punishment. Uh, but uh, in some areas, it gave people a lot more rights than they'd ever had before. In some countries, all of a sudden, you have due process and uh, trial by jury. Uh, people were able to own uh, freedom of speech. People were able to own, a pro own a property in ways they had before. Uh, some areas, it's uh, very limiting. Uh, for example, uh, wives are considered to be basically property of the husband under the Napoleonic Code. So not actually as in slaves, but basically everything a wife brings into marriage, including herself, basically, is the direct responsibility of the husband. And in a divorce, a wife would basically lose everything. She Even if she had before? Yeah, she had before. It's still like that in a lot of countries. It's still a lot of countries. It's all of space on a lot of code. It's still like that. In fact, Louisiana, it had a Napoleonic code for many years. It doesn't inform Napoleon. But remember when Louisiana was sold to the United States, it was under Napoleon's control. And so uh, you have a lot of... You have some very unusual uh, laws, very unusual problems of a kind of other companies trying to do business in Louisiana because contract laws, because of the on a code, they're a little bit different than they are the rest of the country. <laughs> Except they eliminated most parts of Napoleonic Code, particularly uh, and the basically modernized rights for women in Louisiana many years ago. But uh, um, the Napoleonic Code was very common in Louisiana for many years. That's why we still call our counties parishes. Exactly. You call it wood. Parish. Parish. Like Oshita Parish and Lincoln Parish. Yeah. 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 Parish after area of church area of church under church control. Mm -hmm. Except where some people is a tremendous advance in law and civil liberties, for others not so much. Next they kinda of change the orientation of marital relationships in many areas. Of course Louisiana, France, elsewhere women are equal under the law, have full rights, marriage, property, um, politically, and everything else. Just, I guess we're a little bump in the road here in the point on the code. But in spite of these problems, though, it's like in a lot of countries, there are major advances in civil liberties, for the men at least. But uh, 
as Napoleon starts annexing new areas, new territories, basically he's replacing governments with the people friendlier to him, including his own brothers. For example, in 1808, Napoleon's uh, brother is uh, Joseph Bonaparte, is named King of Spain. Is Napoleon's brother? Yeah. Like say, he has Napoleon no had influence on that. Yeah. Yeah, Napoleon basically said his brother, you're going to be King of Spain. Even if he didn't want to be. Well, who wouldn't want to be? It's a nice, cushy job. Yeah. <laughs> power, it's influence, it's money. And for some poor kid from Corsica, the dream come true. What they could ever dream about. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. He has to do basically what his brother says. And he has no world limited lineage, so the people of France are incensed. This Corsican commoner is placed on their throne. This place marks huge insurrections all over Spain that last for years. Well, why, if he's native to Spain, why does he have to go to his brother? As his brother has the army and brothers keeping him in power. In fact, after all these insurrections in Spain last for a couple of years, Napoleon had to basically send his army into Spain for a couple of years. He's nearly killed in a couple of battles uh, trying to keep uh, Joseph Bonaparte on the throne. The Bonaparte's regime is very, very unpopular in Spain. They're for the old Garvin regime. Yeah, it's just like him. So it's pretty much he's sending his brother to keep an eye on him. Pretty much. He's king in name only. The power is with right. Napoleon of Paris. Yeah, he's the king who just put his word in the I said the Papal States in Western Italy are annexed in 1809. Uh, his other brother, Louis, was named King of Holland about the same time. Say another brother? Yeah. Oh man, he's got genius. King of Holland. Uh, in fact, uh, one day uh, they're all having yeah. dinner together. Uh, King Joseph, King Lu King Joseph of Spain, King Louis of Holland, and uh, Emperor Napoleon uh, there in Paris. And he said, two bro brothers are kings. He's an emperor. So the father could only see us now. Two more days to say that he would be Prince Emperor of Spain. So, uh, that's very easy. Pretty, that's, that's a good comparison. A lot of people say he was a great conqueror like Alexander. Uh, people who are not French compare him to Adolf Hitler, but <laughs> it, it depends on how you look at it. Right. But he studied Alexander. Yeah. Right? He, he did. He was doing a lot better he job than people that killed, though, didn't he? Huh? He was doing a lot better job than yeah, say, uh, people were eating, right? Yeah, people were eating. Um, I say there was a system of justice under Napoleon, not like I said, right out the best system in the world, but uh, like I say, you had a system of due process. If you're accused of something, you're going to have a trial. It may not necessarily be a fair trial, but at least you have, at least you have a fighting chance. It's a lot different than you can say under a pillar. Yeah. Like I say, you might, you might be acquitted. You know. I take for example Louis Bonaparte here. Um, actually, a very effective, very popular king called uh, Louis the Good by the uh, people of Holland. Very popular, the people loved him. He wrote with a lot of justice and fairness, respect of the rights of the people, respect of due process and trial by jury. So Holland's been a pretty free country before this, and uh, but Louis know. basically continues a lot of those traditions. But I don't understand that. I don't think he'd be perceived to be so good, but the point is still technically ruling the whole. Yeah. 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 Because Louis made sure the day to day operations are still very fair, even though basically. Napoleon is a very uh, kind of ruling the roost trying to direct uh, foreign affairs, but uh, Louis Bonaparte was very, very popular in Holland. But that's kind of his problem, though, because uh, he's so popular in Holland, people love him so much that his brother Napoleon is very jealous of that kind of popularity and forces Louis Bonaparte to abdicate in 1810. says, you're fired. He fired his own brother. Yeah, basically forced him to quit being king. And France annexes Holland outright, bringing, making it directly part of a French territory. So Yeah. Except he's not king anymore. Uh, Napoleon basically takes over Holland as emperor of France. Interestingly enough, it was his uh, Louis Bonaparte's nephew who ends up becoming uh, Emperor of France uh, some years later. Let's go to that story later. But uh, 
The pub start changing, though. So Napoleon's annexed northern Germany, the Netherlands, northern Italy by 1810. Both of his brother off the throne. But uh, after several years under the continental system, some countries are really bristling under it, so they're going to challenge Napoleon. So in 1810, what Russia withdraws from the continental system, sparking a French economic slump, and fearing that uh, other countries may follow uh, Russia out of the continental system, Napoleon decides he has no choice but try to make an example out of Russia, try to conquer it directly, mm. leading to his disastrous invasion of 1812, which we'll cover next time. Get it spanked. <laughs>